During this month of Ramadan, we have learned and experienced love, humanity, and morality. We hope that you there at home have learned something too. Today, we are humbled to be hosted by Mueshimiwa Zuleha Juma Hassan, nominated MP. Uh, Madam Zuleha, Karibu sana kwenye Ramadan Karim Show on Ibru Africa. My name is Jamal Naso. I'll be your host. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming to my office today. Thank you very much. Tell us, Madam Zuleha, tell us who is Madam Zuleha? Ninani huyu mama tunayemsikia? Uh, Ninani yeye haswa? Okay. Um, I'm a nominated member of parliament. I was nominated by ODM. Kuwakilisha uh, vijana wa Kenya nzima katika bunge la taifa. Naam, uh, ndo kazi yangu hiyo. Kwa hivyo kazi ya mbunge kutengeneza sheria, kuwakilisha vijana bungeni na pia kuhakikisha uh, kuwa serikali kuu inafanya mambo inavyotakana. Uh, uh, tell us, tell us how did you get into politics? Uh, yaani ilikuwaaje mpaka you came to reach uh, being nominated? Uh, just quickly it started in 2006 without me knowing. I formed a Muslim women group in my town of Mariakani. Uh, in Kwale County at the board of Kwale and Kilifi uh, and it grew within six months to more than 2,000 members. Uh, after that my father told me you know a councillor can be elected with less than 2,000 votes so if these women everybody tells their husband their son and so on you know I could be a member of parliament at that time so he told me to run for member of parliament in 2007 but I was more interested in development because that's what I studied at university. So I, know I didn't see the connection between development and politics at the time. So I just used to run away from him. And then 2008, uh, so the elections passed. And then 2008, ODM was having grassroots, grassroots elections. So I, my father told me, if you don't go into party politics now, you'll never make it in future. So because he'd been pushing me for such a long time, I thought, um, you know, let me just go in for him. So that's what I did. And uh, I was elected, those women in my group, they elected me in at the sub-location. Then I was able the next day to move to location. I got in uh, up to constituency, was, which was the branch at that time in 2008. So then we went to Bomas. And in Bomas, um, you know, we are the party who started the two-third gender rule, uh, ODM in our constitution. So halfway through the elections, we had an NDC. Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, Honorable Margaret Wanjiru realized that we didn't have a single woman and we were 50% through uh, the position. So she raised this and because it was the NDC, we changed the constitution there and then and the party constitution and added 16 more positions, two for each region. So Coast got uh, deputy chair for youth for the whole country national and regional representative. So because there were only two of us young people there at Bomas at the time and because I was the more active one, I got the position. So within a month I became a deputy chair for youth for ODM nationally. We understand that you, 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 this field that you are in is a, a male dominated field. So uh, how do you go about it? As I said, you just look at what it is that's needed to do. So then who do you need to lobby, you know, uh, you know, this one and this one, what do you need to say? Um, and I think challenges uh, are just like challenges maybe in other places in life, you know. So for me, if somebody closes the door, I usually look for the window to get in. Like that's not the end of the story. Just because you didn't give me a job or you didn't give me an opportunity, I look for another way to get that opportunity. Although there are a few things, um, but this also I've realized happened to men as well. Like women get threatened with violence and things like that. So I've had some... Some people threaten me, like verbally though, because they think I might want to run in 2017 in, in their areas. So they've threatened me verbally. But uh, the idea for me is not, don't get scared. Don't uh, look intimidated. In fact, sometimes I, I tell them, well, the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, Jesus was stoned to death for pushing forward the truth, you know. So who am I? So I just say, just send those boys and they come and beat me, you know, no problem. So you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't fear. Or if they tell you something, you just tell them, okay, try, try me. Does your family have any political backgrounds? Or, and, 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 and do they support you politically? My father supports me, my husband supports me, my siblings uh, support me. My mother, before she passed away, she didn't have a problem. She supported me. Um, she passed away just two months after. No, just the same month we got sworn into parliament. Yeah, but um, I hear that my grandfather was a nominated uh, member 
of the regional assembly. Just as soon as we got into independence in 63, we had regional assemblies. We had Majimbo, if you remember, right at the beginning. So the, the coast region, they had assembly members. So my grandfather was one of them. But I never met him. He died in 1973, and I was born in 1979. So I think sometimes some of these things move in the blood within the, within the family. I actually have a cousin who is also a member of parliament, previously for Kisauni, um, Anania Mwaboza. Yeah, then I have extended uh, members, uh, maybe like distant family relatives who might be an ambassador or something. You know, but I wasn't really raised directly in politics. Uh, these are people who are on the side. But maybe because my grandfather was in, maybe my father saw there was a potential for me. Maybe he saw something I didn't see in myself. But it's kind of worked out, you know, since he pushed me in. Are you passionate about it? I know that I was interested in doing national policy, but not necessarily, I didn't link it necessarily to maybe lawmaking as well. But then this is a perfect opportunity, especially in Kenya, as a, uh, a member of parliament, you can do both. You can come to parliament and legislate, you can go to the ground, do programs, speak to people, know what needs to you know, get done, come back up to parliament, amend a law or whatever it is yet. So there's definitely a link. So my passion is in it, or, so I've, you know, is, is in it now, and now I get to speak with more people maybe than I would have reached if I wasn't in parliament. So I'm getting to even maybe achieve more yeah, towards, uh, towards my personal goals even before. So we can, think, we, we can say thank you to your father? Yes, Asante Baba. Yeah, thanks a lot. I really appreciate. <laughs>
Yeah, um, I just I just manage it maybe like you would other work. Um, you know, if I'm fasting, I'm fasting. So you know, I, I, I you know I won't eat until that time. Sometimes I might spend two three hours before I have dinner or something maybe during Ramadan because there's you know another meeting and another meeting. But I can break my fast with you know a glass of water and some and something like that. So it's working fine. And in terms of prayer, if I'm traveling, then I pray you know like a traveler. So I can pray Fajr and then I can mix Zuhur and Asr and mix Maghrib and Isha. And then um, on normal days, I'll, I'll make time and space, you know, run out five minutes, ten minutes and, and you know, and, and pray and so on. Yeah. You being a mother, and how do you multitask here? Okay, kwa sababu mumu wangu wame nikubalia niwe katika siyasa, kuna tuseme sacrifices ambo lazima tufanyi. Kwa hivyo pengine kuna siku kadha ramadhani atapata chakula changu, kuna siku hatapata kula chakula changu. Uh, lakini vile tuwaishi sasa mumu wangu basically yuko based nyumbani coast, mini ko Nairobi bunge kwa sababu ya kazi, because most of the days niko hapa bungeni, uh, kama yumanine paka alhamisi niko bungeni, na kwa sababu hizo ndo siku tatu katika siku tano za shule, mtoto wangu kwanza na miaka 4 tu yuko KG1. Kwa hivyo anasoma hapa pia niwe karibu naye. Zile siku tatu angalau ambao niko Nairobi naweza kumsaidia na homework na masala kama hayo. Na mtoto mwingine wa mwaka mmoja pia anaishi naye Nairobi. So mimi kind of sehemu yangu ni Nairobi. Lakini mume wangu yasafiri. So huko nyumbani yuko na family, yeshi yuko na mama uh, mama ke karibu ajo vile tukishi coast especially huko kijijini kuna nyumba ya mama pale nyumba yetu hapa nyumba ya shemegi mwingine hapa na kadhalika kwa hivyo watu nafuturu kama family kwa hivyo ile uh, chakula ni kile kile tuseme tungepika lakini tukikutana hivyo tukiwa pamoja siku mbili tatu siku nne siku tano you know atapata na hata kama sitapika chakula chote hata kama ni chakula kimoja baina vile hata kama ni viazi karaya hata kama ni kaimati itakuwa ni yangu kwa sababu pengine muda atakuwa hautoshi uh, what challenges do you face I think one of, one of the challenges, if I think about it, is, you know, as Muslims, we were not allowed to shake hands cro across the genders. So I can shake a woman's hand and I can hug a woman, but I can't shake a man's hand and I can't hug a man, you know, who's not my family. So that's usually the first thing, especially politically, you know, people expect in an area where there are suits, you know, formality, maybe with ambassadors, with ministers in other countries. And the first thing a man does is, you know, uh, give you their hand. Even MPs just here in Kenya or senators give you their hand to shake. And you can't, so you're stuck. And the moment you say, I don't shake hands, you know, then the conversation changes to what you could have discussed to now, why aren't you shaking my hand? You know, so it, it changes. So that's, imagine that's a, it, it seems like a relative small thing, but it's one of the challenges. But I think it's good because in Kenya, we're different religions, different cultures. We come from different backgrounds. When you come in a melting plot like parliament, we come from different parts of the country. It's nice to know more about each other. So it's a talent for me to know about cultures of others and it's a challenge for others to know about cultures of me. I think that's the biggest, biggest challenge uh, uh, for me. Can you imagine it or not? The other things, I see them as I told you earlier, just as ordinary challenges that maybe every human being needs to go through and, 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 and uh, pass around. But I think the Muslim community appreciates that they are Muslim women and that Muslim women need a voice because previously we haven't had a voice in government. So when the national cake is being divided, you know, we're not there. We might not have someone up there to push, you know, what are our issues, yeah, to push our issues. Maybe there are problems that uh, a Muslim man can't bring to parliament uh, or another type of woman, another maybe a, a non-Muslim woman can't bring to parliament. But only a Muslim woman would know that this is a problem, so they'd bring to parliament.
as a Muslim girl, what is this thing that you have grown up seeing and, and, and remembering and being so proud of it? Um, okay, I can say maybe th there was a time when I was a bit younger, I wasn't wearing my hijab all the time, or it would fall off and so on. And then there was a time when I consciously now, I knew what the meaning of hijab was when I was around uh, 19. And I now consciously made sure that I had my hijab on the whole time and I covered my hair and it never fall off by accident and so on. So I, I noticed that there was a difference between how men would react to me in the streets. Before, you know, they would whistle at you, uh, hey girl, make cat calls and so on. But after putting proper hijab, I wouldn't get that. So I began to appreciate that. Uh, it made me proud because even now in my work now, I don't have, you know, when people are talking to me, they're not talking to me because, or men, as a woman, or because, you know, I'm somebody, you know, they can manipulate and so on. They're just looking at me as a colleague. You know, and there's a, there's a colleague who said, you know, the hijab of Muslim women when you're covered, it makes you asexual, as if you're not a sexual being. So that's really nice for me, it makes my work easy. So I'm just getting through my work and what I need to accomplish, rather than people making cat calls, you know, or other colleagues just, you know, uh, looking at you, maybe how you're, you know, how you're dressed and so on. So it, 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 it limits that. So for me, I like that. So we can just deal with the work, let's get down to business, let's do this, let's finish and, and that's it. We are our Muslim girls to put on hijabs all through right and uh, they have to get educated in schools there are some other schools that feel that this is not the right place to practice to practice this faith what's your take on that actually when you're talking about maybe giving back what I've given back in the community and some of the things that I've told you that maybe a Muslim man can't raise in Parliament and maybe women who are not Muslim can't raise in Parliament. That's it's the hijab issue. So last year I was able to request a statement from the Cabinet Secretary for Education, Kaimeni, to ask him to come and answer to Parliament and tell us what the status of Muslim, the welfare of Muslim students in general was. One of the main uh, reasons for it was hijab. There are many, many, many hundreds there are like of public schools that deny Muslim girls the right to wear hijab. Uh, they're not even allowed to wear long skirts to cover their leg. And when they're wearing a short skirt, they're not even allowed to wear trousers to cover their leg. And you know, for a Muslim woman who's practicing her religion, if you tell them to remove their hijab, it's like you're telling a man to walk without their trousers on. You know, they'll feel naked they'll feel uh, degraded, they'll feel humiliated, and all those kinds of emotions will come in. So I was even nominated, not nominated, I was awarded Muslim Woman of the Year for 2014, uh, last year, because of championing Muslim women rights, especially to wear hijab uh, and practice their, their, their religion. And you'll see now even, I just got two calls today, there's a, a school uh, uh, in Bura, and there's a school in Taita Taveta, which have, are, doing, are having these problems. So we have a lawyer, there's an Isiolo case that happened last year, uh, we're having a lawyer on the case, so I've, I've, I've transferred those to lawyers, because you know, in parliament I can only do so much, but we need to now, because the law is there to protect uh, Muslim girls and to practice their religion, all Kenyans to practice their religion, it's just now implementation, so now we're going to court to go to the judiciary side to see, you know, so that they can come up with a judgment that will be for, for posterity, so I'm pushing that issue. So I don't agree with that. I know now there are students who are not fasting in Ramadan uh, because maybe a school takes breakfast at 6 o'clock and they can't have it at 4 a.m. You know, before the fast start, they're not allowed to. And they can't go out to go and buy food. Then then maybe the six, school also has dinner at 6 o'clock. They're forced to eat at 6. So at 6.30, you can't start having dinner at 6.30, you know. So now they can't stay hungry 24 hours, so they're not fasting because of that. But I'm asking principals and everybody, we need to have cohesion in our country. We have to accept each other the way we are. We will never, you can, you will never all be the same. What are you planning uh, in giving back to the community? Uh, in all, you know. What I do for the whole year, I try, as, as I told you, I'm interested in development. So right now within my county, I've, I've bought uh, agriculture kits so that young women, no, I mean women and youth can get involved in agriculture using modern technology to increase their income so that they are getting food 
the whole way, you know, they have money in their pocket and they can buy food for their families the whole year through. But um, with Ramadan, so far I've only, since it started, I've only had one day where I was able to break fast uh, with some women. But um, apart from sitting together and, and breaking fast, um, I've also uh, been buying like dates or iftar to give, to share out to, to people. And as soon as I get uh, settled, I'll also, I'll also uh, host another fast. So maybe two or, or three more uh, in the rem remaining uh, Ramadan. What do you have to tell those uh, Muslim girls who have talent? Just to tell them that um, study your religion first of all. There are do's and don'ts uh, that we can't do as a Muslim woman. So study your religion, uh, have somebody who's close to you, a sheikh, an imam. If you're, you have a talent and you want to pursue it, just go and find out whether you know you can do it or not. Uh, growing up, I used to be a very good, I still am a very good singer. But singing, uh, especially in this modern way, and Islam couldn't come together. I couldn't do the music industry successfully and then also be able to practice my religion. You know, I'd need to wear kinky and all those kind of things, maybe sing songs that I'm not. So I've left that career. But, um, I've, you know, so I've, I've chosen uh, to do, for, for instance, politics. And that's the reality like, of our religion, and that's okay. So I do singing in like private uh, sphere when I'm only with women, so I still have my fun and so on. Um, so my, the other talent is that. So just, you know, because at the same time you don't want to uh, offend God, at the same time you still have dreams. So just study, and don't just listen to people who are telling you you can't do this, you can't do this. Just study uh, your religion, know what you can do. You know, if you want to be a comedian, stand up, just, you know, know that kind of comedy, because I know of mothers and fathers who do comedy and they do comedy for families that families can all sit in one place and be able to you know they're not rude jokes so you know you just you just do so you use your parameters and you become very successful and especially if you have a niche you know if you have a special niche in which your talent is uh, you're running your talent then people respect you and you actually grow in that niche so you see as a Muslim woman I've just learned what can I do or can't do as a Muslim woman within politics so I'm sticking to that and I'm still successful Alhamdulillah in my career so you can do the same thing so for you to feel safe so instead of completely just staying at home and not coming out and worrying Go do your research, find out, you know, pray about it, make istikhara about it, and then, you know, continue and do what it is that you want to do. And inshallah, you see you're successful and you're not crossing the borders, yeah, of the religion. So I'd like to encourage Muslims to continue the spirit of Ramadan even in the other months. And that's when we'll be really successful and that's when uh, we will be doing what it is that our religion envisions us to gain from Ramadan. Um, and with that, I'd like to wish all Muslims in Kwale, in coast region, in the country, in the whole country, Kenya, and also in the world, um, Ramadan uh, Mubarak and Saw Makbul, inshallah, and uh, to spread the message of love all over the, the world, just as our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. Honorable Zuleha Juma Hassan, we say thank you very much. We know you're a very busy lady and, uh, and, and uh, on your field you have so many things to do but you've given us uh, an opportunity to, to host us and, and we say thank you and we are very grateful. We wish you and your family uh, Ramadan Karim and uh, a coming Eid Mubarak. We wish you a Saum Makbul. Uh, please keep up with your, with your work. You're doing a very good job. And uh, politically, we do also wish you your wishes to come true, your dreams that you have for the youth, and everything else. Uh, Allahu Barik. Thank you very much. Shukran. Well, that has been a great show for today. You have seen we've been uh, with our Honorable and uh, we are very grateful. For those people who are watching us at home, we say till tomorrow, same time, same, same place. This is Ramadan Karim. Jamal Nasr has been your host. Bye-bye.